Okay, good afternoon. Uh, well, first off, you know, I think I have more slides than 10 minutes, so I'll skip over material. Uh, and uh, some of the basic material we already heard. It was nice to hear about uh, uh, measurement data and so on. And I'm presenting more about uh, architectural research ideas uh, and, and such. Uh, so uh, we know about uh, many <clears throat> uh, recent disasters, and uh, uh, there were power outages and flooding disrupted uh, telecom services uh, for Hurricane Sandy that, that we know about. Um, the Japan earthquake and uh, tsunami, about uh, 1,500 telecom buildings uh, were affected by the main shock, and then there was an aftershock that affected another 700 telecom buildings. The Sichuan earthquake in China, 30,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable and 4,000 uh, telecom central offices were damaged. And uh, Katrina, uh, telecom network availability was reduced from five nines to about 85% uh, by power outages uh, and, and so on. And it is also uh, studies that show that uh, the number of category four and five hurricanes are on the rise, so we are living in a disaster-prone world. And so I'm looking at uh, issues for network adaptability uh, for these uh, disaster events and cascading correlated failures. And this work is actually supported by the DTRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, where you know, it's mainly military use that they're looking at, but many of these approaches are really dual use okay, for uh, uh, general disasters as well. So here are terms that I'll be uh, talking about. Uh, and hope they become uh, clearer. Uh, how to exploit excess capacity in our networks to improve network resilience, determination of disaster zones, uh, risk-aware provisioning for normal preparedness. You know, normally we wouldn't like to locate uh, important facilities or communication infrastructure or even routes through, you know, disaster areas. If, you know, if I'm flying to Asia, you know, I'd probably not uh, try to change planes in Kabul right now. Uh, so. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, data replication, you know, we have more and more cloud services, right? You know, put, we are putting stuff in the cloud. So, you know, the traditional notion of uh, uh, telco operators uh, has, has been, you know, network connectivity, you know. But now we have to uh, enhance that uh, technique towards, you know, what I call uh, content connectivity. Uh, and our networks should be self-organizing all the time. So with whatever resources we have available and working, you know, we should reprovision our resources for providing backups and, and so on. And, and the other point is uh, uh, multipath provision for degrade services uh, in, in the sense that, you know, we'd like to provide a, as much service to everybody as possible, but when uh, resources are scarce, you know, we'd like to provide as much, as good quality of service uh, to uh, users as, as possible. So essentially for, uh, Normal preparedness. So essentially, I, I have you know three different topics. Normal preparedness is you know under current circumstances, you know, can I know about you know what are various hazards like uh, seismic hazard maps, tornado activity, hurricane risk activity, flood risk map, etc., and prepare ourselves better. And then when an event is going to happen, if I have some advance notice, can I reprovision? Can I self-organize? And after an event has occurred, can I try to provide as good quality of service as possible? But if that is not possible, you know, I'll provide reduced level of service, you know, uh, rather than no service at all. Um, so uh, uh, a, a lot of the, the talk is really based on more, you know, fiber layer architecture, fiber layer network architecture. So, so this is like a layer one. Uh, network, you know, that can be operated by uh, level three or AT&T and, and so on. And then riding on top of that are our virtual networks, like layer two connectivity. And then uh, we have our layer three connectivity. So uh, ISPs, uh, enterprises, large institutional users of bandwidth, you know, have their network connectivity, but do they really have very good visibility on how their various uh, links are routed. For example, from uh, I, I could be a, an ISP, a large institution user of bandwidth, and have connection from uh, at, at my layer three network from New York to Chicago, New York to Cleveland, New York to Columbus. Do I know if they share the same conduit somewhere? 
Well, in the telco world, you know, we do have this concept of SRG, shared risk group, and so we can use that. But if they're not sharing the same conduit, but they're within 30 kilometers of each other, and they're part of the same disaster zone, you know, do we know that as well? Okay. So this is where, you know, having a good idea of disaster zones and performing uh, uh, risk uh, aware provisioning is important. All right, so when we have failure uh, of infrastructure uh, due to disaster, uh, it can cause uh, various cascading failures, and we refer to horizontal cascading failures as those that progress from node to node at the you know, same layer itself. And then we have what we call vertical cascading failures because a failure in the fiber layer will induce failures at higher layers as well, you know, which might take a little longer to show up. Okay? But you know, I might lose three separate connections because of the same you know, fiber cut or same failure. Okay? So uh, multiple correlated cascading failures can occur, and they depend on many parameters. Recovery times can be long. Uh, estimating the damage uh, requires interdisciplinary knowledge. And this is where, you know, I come from networking background, but uh, we want to use information from geology, climatology, environmental sciences, etc., uh, in order to improve the uh, service qualities and uh, improve our, you know, disaster preparedness. All right, uh, so this is, uh, you know, a, a timeline of what happens you know, for uh, manage, uh, during the disaster event. So, so normally, pre-disaster, okay, let's say this is the amount of capacity that we need for carrying our traffic, but we will offer some more because we have to provide backups as well, okay? And then when disaster occurs, uh, um, actually, this is normal, what we call normal preparedness, where we are using the excess capacity in the network to exploit, uh, to exploit it to protect networks against possible disasters. Um, let me jump forward here. So in any network, we have some excess capacity, which is the extra operational capacity for backups purposes, or because the network is actually engineered for peak traffic, plus some additional headroom, so that over the next year or so, you know, we don't have to have additional capex all the time. So this could be the amount of capacity on a link, and this is typically you know, usage pattern. So all of this is excess. So some of this we can use for our resilience purposes, even then, we'll have a lot more left over. And our networks are sort of Jurassic in the sense that, you know, we have everything turned on all the time. And all of the excess capacity that we don't need, even after providing resiliency, you know, we need to develop methods to turn them off because otherwise, you know, we're just wasting energy. All right, I have three minutes left, so let me just move on. So normal preparedness means, you know, I have, a, let's say, a fiber map like this, and I look at a transportation map because uh, the, the fibers are actually laid next to uh, rights of ways, and then I superimpose my seismic hazard maps and uh, various other maps, and as a result, I get, you know, if I do risk unaware routing, so these dots that you see, they are my risky regions, and if I'm not aware of them, okay, this is what my routing might turn out to be. The thick lines over here, you know, correspond to the amount of capacity that's provisioned over those links. Whereas if I do risk aware provisioning, and of course there are a lot of details here that I'm not showing, okay, then, you can see that you know, we are trying to avoid, uh, avoid the risky regions. Okay, in some cases, we may not be able to avoid the risky regions totally because you know, some of the traffic originates or terminates in those regions as well. And as we move stuff into the cloud, okay, uh, normally our network operators will provide you a primary path and a backup path you know, between a source and a destination. But now, you know, instead of having network connectivity, uh, content connectivity becomes more important. So, my primary, primary traffic or primary data can be here. My backup data can be here. I just have to ensure that you know, one of them is always available by avoiding disaster zones. And I can have multiple replications as well, uh, but I have to avoid my disaster zones. So I already talked about network uh, connectivity versus content connectivity, so let me just... Uh, and, and then there's uh, uh, SDN techniques uh, that, that can be used to to facilitate uh, some of these things. So anyway, traditional methods for fault management you know, are well practiced, and uh, I'm, I don't have to spend time on them. Uh, and these are all uh, pretty well practiced in our uh, network. So okay, so now, when disaster occurs, we need better or enhanced preparedness. So if a disaster is predicted, network resources can be rearranged to better prepare the network for the predicted disaster. So this is when we do reprovisioning. 
Um, so better preparedness could be, uh, so here we have our network and, and let us say this is the region that will be affected. And uh, so network can be better prepared by reprovisioning of resources and redissemination of uh, data. So I can move my data to uh, areas that are safer. And uh, we might even relocate some of the hardware resources if, if that becomes possible. Okay? And then post-disaster events, um, uh, to recover uh, crucial services, you know, we do reprovisioning uh, using the excess capacity. And if we can't provide full bandwidth, okay, we can exploit what we call multi-path provisioning, where a connection's full bandwidth is provided through multiple paths in order to guarantee some degree of service. And here, let me show you an example. So let us say we have you know, a part of our network like this, and these uh, blue areas are our uh, disaster uh, zone areas, and we need a connection from Palo Alto, or a bandwidth pipe, or a, from Palo Alto to uh, El Paso, and uh, of bandwidth B. So we can set it up like this, using our traditional methods, which is risk unaware. But using a risk aware approach, you know, we can actually provide a backup of half uh, 0.5b, so if the primary fails, you know, I have uh, you know, half of the capacity over the backup. Or I can go even further and I can do some other things, such as you know, I can do multi-paths, so half 0.5b over this path, 0.3b over this path, 0.2b over this path. So if this fails, I still have the other two to provide me 0.5b. If the middle one fails, I have 0.8b, okay, and, and then so on. Okay, so this is the concept of uh, reduced level of service, you know, when full service can't be guaranteed, okay? Anyway, I'm running out of time, and so this is a slide that I had showed before uh, about exploiting excess capacity to improve network resilience, uh, determining disaster zones through um, geology maps and so on. Uh, for normal preparedness, uh, have risk-aware provisioning, and uh, data replication and content connectivity are important concepts with uh, cloud-based services. Uh, Reprovisioning, for better preparedness and post-disaster events, and uh, multi-path provisioning can be exploited to provide you know, degraded services or reduced level of service when full service can't be guaranteed. So in a summary then, you know, so being prepared is very important, and then being better prepared you know, should be also done, and uh, uh, post-disaster uh, events uh, uh, didn't post disaster events, you know, providing uh, as much good quality service as possible is something that we should try to strive for. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>